You are now tuned into the Black Law Students Association of Canada's YouTube. Thank you for your attention. And without further ado, I will now see the floor to our Honorable Justices of the Diversity High Court of Canada, Honorable Justice Russell Brown, Honorable Justice Sheila L. Martin. I am so sorry if I mispronounce your name. Um, Honorable Justice Glenn Bogo. Did I say it correctly? Uh, no, that would be Guylaine Bogé. I am so sorry. I will try it again when I'm on mute. Um, Honorable Justice Kofi Barnes. The floor is yours. All right. Um, who is going to be our president? Justice Brown or Justice Martin? Or Justice Bogé? Or Justice Barnes. <laughs> Do I get to decide? Uh, <laughs> Uh, so much pressure on me. Sheila, I can't. You're, Sheila, you're dead center in my stream. Right. Okay. So, so you know that would be that's where the that's where Madame la Présidente should be. I think dead center. All right. So is Justice uh, um, uh, Martin our uh, Justice Brown our president? No, I meant I meant Sheila because she's dead oh, okay. on the screen. Okay. So well, Sheila, take, take it away, Grand Fromage. Yes. All right. Are are we all content then um, uh, that we'll answer or we'll ask questions whenever uh, we like, and that our protocol will obviously be that we'll unmute ourselves before we ask a question, and that will be a way to signal to probably ourselves and and uh, hopefully the uh, the mooters as well that uh, that's uh, that's what we're going to do um, so uh, without further ado uh, then I would like uh, to call the case of Williams and Canada Minister of Health and may I please uh, ask uh, the applicants and respondents to introduce themselves before we begin Good afternoon, Justices. My name is Nasra Muman, and together with my co-counsel, Flora Juma, we represent the appellant, Mr. Jamal Williams. Our friends represent the respondent, the Minister of Health. The current pandemic has thrown into sharp relief the socioeconomic disparities across racial groups that continue to contribute to poorer health outcomes for Black people. The case at bar concerns a critique of the government's current data collection scheme as it relates to the pandemic. Pursuant to the powers afforded her under the Department of Health Act, the Minister of Health has chosen to collect disaggregated data on COVID contraction, recovery, and mortality rates as it regards age and sex, but has made the conscious policy choice to exclude race from its decision-making calculus. It is in response to this oversight that the appellants seek the following two orders. First, we seek that this court overturn the decision by the Supreme Court and declare the minister's actions unconstitutional. And secondly, we are seeking an order directing the minister to begin collecting disaggregated race-based data in relation to the pandemic and its consequences. The appellants will make three submissions before the court. I will address the first, that the minister's refusal to collect disaggregated race-based data is in violation of section seven of the charter. While my co-counsel, Ms. Juma, will address our second submission that the minister's actions are in violation of section 15, and our final submission that these charter violations cannot be saved under section one. Barring any questions on the facts, I will begin our section seven submissions and they begin at paragraph six of the appellant factum. Broadly speaking, our section seven argument is based on five principles. First, that section seven is engaged because of an increased likelihood of contracting and dying from COVID-19. Second, that it is the minister's failure to collect disaggregated race-based data 
that contributes to this deprivation of the right to life. I would flag now that we will rely on our written submissions as it pertains to the right to liberty and the right to security of the person. Thirdly, the minister's actions here are arbitrary insofar as they bear no policy, they bear no relation to the underlying policy objectives of their COVID-19 response. I wonder Fourthly, if you can elaborate on that. I noticed that argument in your fact. And, and if you could just describe for me the policy imperative that, under which the minister is acting and, and how this isn't consistent with it. Justice, insofar as the policy objective of the Minister of Health is to collect data that will inform itself of what policies to take in response to limit the spread of COVID-19, to reduce the mortality rates associated with it, and to quicken economic recovery, a willful blindness to the Black experience in each of these respects is necessarily anathema to that policy objective. In the same way that the Minister of Health is collecting data on the basis of age and sex because of underlying knowledge that those those identifiers contribute to poor health outcomes or can point to uh, can point to particular vulnerabilities associated with those identities we think that the over that it is an oversight to exclude race consciously in that way our fourth point is that section 7 can and ought to be capable excuse me Section 7 can and ought to be capable of being interpreted as uh, capable of imposing positive obligations on the state. And finally, that a critical race theory lens demands a positive right to health be included in the Charter. With respect to our first subpoint on the increased likelihood of dying, the test articulated by the Supreme Supreme Court to determine a Section 7 violation was articulated in Goslin and elsewhere in the jurisprudence, and that test has two parts to it. First, we the appellants have to demonstrate a sufficient causal connection between the minister's actions here and the deprivation of the right to life. And secondly, we must be able to show that this breach is not in keeping with the principles of fundamental justice. With respect to the sufficient causal connection, the minister's failure to collect disaggregated race-based data increases the risk of death for Black people in Canada, such as our client, because it wrongly discounts the close link between race and the social determinants of poor health. Social determinants that are made all the more deadly in a pandemic context. Poverty, unemployment, precarious housing, and a number of other social inequities that social science tells us directly correlate to poorer health outcomes are disproportionately experienced by Black people in this country. With respect to social determinants specifically related to access to adequate healthcare services, issues such as medical racism or a misunderstanding among the medical community of the underlying conditions prevalent among Black people that exacerbate the symptoms of COVID-19 only are dis again disproportionately experienced by Black Canadians. May I interrupt you here? It would seem to me that part of the um, issue in front of this court is that it will be difficult for you to establish a disproportionate impact under Section 7 because you don't have the data to support it. Uh, what do we do with that claim in terms of uh, its potential uh, circularity or inherent difficulty? Justice, we would rely in part on the social science evidence that we have of the connection between, rels with, between race and healthcare outcomes, as well as the COVID-19 numbers in comparable countries that have a white majority population that are Western liberal democracies and have the same historic disadvantages associated with anti-Black racism persisting today. It is because of that connection that we know to be so real that results in Black people being twice as likely to contract and die from this disease as their white counterparts in the United States and in the United Kingdom, that we know this connection between race and health is a real one and is costing us Black lives every single day. 
but we do recognize the importance of taking an understanding of what this means in a Canadian context and how there may be differences in the sorts of policies the Minister of Health ought to interpret compared to countries like the US and the UK. And part of the reason we're bringing this application is precisely because we don't know the exact nature of that relationship in a Canadian context. The fact that this connection is complicated doesn't absolve the government of its responsibility to some of the most vulnerable and marginalized people in this country. And the government cannot I'm claim- um, I'm wondering, Ms. Moomin, what does this look like on the ground? I mean, how do you actually collect the data? Because the, the respondent or the, the, um, the respondent is the federal minister of health. And it strikes me that much of what you're, you're wanting may fall within provincial jurisdiction. Justice, we recognize even on the ground in provincial and even municipal jurisdictions that some steps are being taken uh, at that level of government, specifically as it regards data collection on the basis of race. We've seen in places like Ontario, Toronto specifically, that that data is being collected. However, as the largest purveyor and provider of medical services in this country, the Department of Health is in a unique position to be able to determine that. But more importantly, to assess the government's policy um, it can inform other policy decisions made by the federal government in terms of resource allocation, which in itself has to be done at a federal level. Um, just picking up from what Justice Brown indicated, just so I understand. So what you are asking us to do in this case is to determine whether the minister should collect such data and not how the minister should collect the data. Is that correct? That's correct. Insofar as the minister's already undertaken this data collection on a disaggregated basis along the lines of age and sex, we are simply asking that it be folded into that existing infrastructure for reasons of administrative expediency anyway. On to our second point. Yeah, may I oh. just jump in there? Um, what about the argument that the, the minister may, may put forward, which is that as a medical condition, it's tied to human bodies and therefore they get to choose that they're going to use biologically based criteria like age and sex to the extent that they are um, rather than social determinants. Uh, what about the argument that they have the authority to make that kind of determination that that is what's relevant in their view in a health context? With respect, Justice, we think that that's an attempt by the government then to obfuscate its responsibility to some of the most vulnerable people in this country who have suffered a historic disadvantage, often at the hands of the state. We think that simply because- It doesn't answer the distinction though, does it? Right, I mean, the distinction that Justice Martin draws is well, okay, here are some biologically informed criteria in the, and why cannot the government say, we are going to go on the basis of biologically informed criteria, I mean, it's, um, I mean, it may have the effect of 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 under you know, of failing to meet a duty that you say exists, but 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 quite apart from that, is is it not a valid distinction? Justice, there are a lot of biological criteria associated with race that we think that the Minister of Health isn't taking into account seriously enough because they lack the data to support that conclusion. For instance, a lot of the underlying conditions that make Black people so vulnerable to this particular virus are biological conditions, however, are not being taken seriously into account without the numbers to back them up. We think that race in the same way as age or sex can inform the government's decision-making processes in this way. On to our second point, that the deprivation can directly be attributed to the minister's choices here. In light of the clear relationship between health and race, data collection itself is a, must be a priority for any reasonable government response to the pandemic. Using disaggregated race-based data to inform healthcare policies is by no means a new phenomenon. If we take Brazil in the, 19, in the late 1990s, for instance, it was only after data collection on infant mortality rates across various skin tones that a massive disparity between indigenous and white babies was revealed. And it was only after the collection and publication of such data that we witnessed a shift in policy objectives by the state and public pressure in response to this outrageous disparity that then led to that gap closing. 
we've similarly seen positive effects take place in places that have begun collecting disaggregated race-based data in relation to the pandemic. In places like New York and the United Kingdom, we've seen government officials uh, taking concerted steps to engage with com racial, racialized communities to ensure that Mar to take steps to ensure that um, rapid testing is increased in marginalized communities, that education and awareness campaigns in relation to the pandemic are given uh, in multiple languages to ensure that that itself doesn't continue to be a barrier. There are a number of ways we can see similar effects take place only if this data is collected as a first step. Now, I want to be clear here that it is the appellant's primary position that we are not seeking to impose a positive obligation. That insofar as the Minister of Health has already chosen to collect disaggregated data on the basis of age and sex, but not race, at issue here truly is an absence, or is, is not an absence of government action, but rather an inadequacy and unconstitutionality of their current approach. Drawing on the decision, oh, apologies, Justice Martin, did you have a question? I did. Um, and that is, uh, is there a positive obligation to do anything under Section 7? Uh, I mean, I know you're arguing that this is not because they've entered the terrain. Uh, but does Section 7 um, allow us, even if we said, well, we think this is a positive obligation, could, could we deal with it under Section 7? How do we deal with it under the principles of fundamental justice? And is it better dealt with under 15? Yes, Justice. While it is our primary contention that this isn't a positive obligation, even if it were to be deemed as such, the order that we're seeking, we submit in the alternative that Section 7 can be interpreted as capable of imposing positive obligations. Um, I will get to this more later on, but just uh, to give you an essence of the argument, essentially we are drawing by the possibility of imposing positive obligations left open by the Supreme Court in Goslin, uh, as well as in other cases such as Blanco where Section 7 may be engaged by government inaction in extreme cases. And it's our position that the extreme circumstances of this pandemic are precisely the sort of, are precisely the sort of circumstances that the Supreme Court has envisaged. But Blanco, you, you definitely had a scheme that was already going. I mean, the problem was, was that they had set up a scheme that wasn't operating quickly enough, was the problem. Um, <clears throat> So I'm not Justice. sure. That, I'm not, I think that may be more authority for the distinction that you're trying to draw in order to say that this isn't a positive obligation. But I'm not sure that Blanco does the work for you that you need it to make uh, as a positive obligation. At paragraph 83 in Blanco is particularly what we would like to draw attention to. It's stating that it is government inaction only in extreme situations that may require uh, in which case that the judiciary may require the state to take positive steps. We're applying that in this case simply to mean that where a pandemic has left more than 2 million people dead in the span of a single year and whose economic repercussions are going to be felt for possibly generations to come, and especially by Canada's Black uh, community, that we cannot afford to ignore the acute harms being faced in that case. And that it's on that stance that we would say that it, those are the very reasons why we can't get too bogged down in in in, um, in data collection. We just need to move quickly, and we need to take um, reasonable and economic and 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 um, efficient steps. Um, and there's <clears throat> um, just oh. the quality to the argument. I understand, but but. Uh, Nonetheless, there it is, and it's, and it's there for you to answer. Justice, we would recharacterize the sort of administrative concerns that the respondents are likely to raise here, simply because the Minister of Health is already engaged and already has a data collection scheme along disaggregated uh, criteria. That it's not as uh, burdensome, for instance, uh, to fold this, our order, the order being sought here into the existing structure. If I could briefly now turn to the principles of fundamental justice. The holding by the Supreme Court in Bedford stated that a government action is going to be arbitrary where it bears no relation to the underlying policy objectives. Insofar as it is a minister's 
objective to collect data that will better enable it to develop policies that limit the spread of COVID-19, reduce the deaths arising as a result, and to quicken economic recovery. They cannot ignore the close relationship and the clear relationship between race and healthcare outcomes that we have based on social science evidence telling us that health and race are inextricably linked and in comparable countries such as the United Kingdom, where even taking into account um, geographical and social and economic factors, such as employment, job type, education level, uh, and, and the like, that the gap between black and white outcomes may be lessened slightly, but still is significant. We know race itself to be a vital component that the government must take into its decision-making calculus, and its failure to do so thus far bears no relation to this policy objective. But may I ask you why you're, you are arguing that on the basis of a lack of connection, a lack of logic or irrationality? Um, do you have an argument um, under current jurisprudence, and should you have an argument under the jurisprudence of the doctrine that you would like to bring forward, that there's a substantive equality dimension to the principles of fundamental justice that go more to the core here than whether or not there's a connection or fit? Justice, we do believe that there is more of a substantive understanding of equality that needs to be taken into account. Um, with respect to Section 15, that is something that my, my co-counsel is going to address. But in relation to Section 7, we would draw on the decision in Dunmore that stated that substantive exclusion from a protective regime devised by government, in this case, the data collection um, along important uh, social factors, uh, can be tantamount to an affirmative interference with one's charter rights. Well, how, that, how, how is that exclusion? I mean, I, mean, I wonder if we're defining the, 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 the service here correctly. Service isn't data collection. The service is treating people, um, responding to the pandemic. And, and, and I don't see, I, I, I wonder if it is fair um, to break down every component of the service and say, well, this has to be done in a certain way. This has to be done in a certain way. You know, I, I, I mean, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the courts have the institutional competence to, uh, to get into those kinds of uh, details. Justice, we would say that it's a substantive exclusion from a government service insofar as the Minister of Health's broader policy response to COVID-19 is informed by the data that it collects. It has enabled itself to recognize the particular vulnerabilities associated with one's age and with one's sex, but has refused to acknowledge the very clear relationship that one's healthcare outcomes is going to have with race. We think that has the effect of creating an affirmative interference with our clients and Black Canadians more broadly's right to life. If I could just interrupt you for, for now, for now. I, I'm just still thinking about uh, the last question. Um, I understand that the objective here is to treat people. I'm putting it in very simple terms. Uh, how is the failure to collect the data linked to a failure to treat people? Justice, if we take, for example, the government's vaccine rollout program that is slated to begin, race would play a critical factor insofar as there is a well-founded fear among many Black Canadians of trusting a healthcare infrastructure that has historically mistreated and marginalized people on the basis of their race. That is why we see at least anecdotal evidence showing that Black people, many Black people, have a well-founded fear of even receiving that vaccine. That in itself is something a government needs to avail itself and make itself aware of in its response to the pandemic. How will data collection help them respond by encouraging Black people to, to take the vaccine when it's made available? At the very least, Justice, it allows us to, it allows the minister to take into account the very real concern that Black people have and be able to make policy and perhaps educational and awareness campaigns more curtailed to that end but it won't be able to do that without data collection on whether or not black people are receiving adequate treatment when they go to hospitals and the like. But you're not wanting that. You're just wanting data collection about whether people, whether about, about people's race. 
not about whether they're getting adequate treatment. That's that's what the data would be used for down the road. But but you're wanting data collection about race, mm -hmm. and 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 I'm 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 with Justice Barnes. I'm I'm not sure if if I'm understanding the connection between that and treatment. Justice, what we would say is that to, for the government to enable itself to change its provision of services to better reflect and better address uh, inequities on the basis of race, they need to at least at the very first take this step of collecting data to recognize that there is a discrepancy in the ability for Black people to access adequate health care. That in itself is going to come with data that confirms what black, the Black lived experience has told us, that is, that Black people are likely uh, contracting and dying from this disease at a far higher rate relative to the white majority population. I see that I'm low on time. If I could just now move on to our final point on the positive right to health briefly. While the order sought by the appellants in this case is on a discrete policy oversight by the Minister of Health, the infringement of Section 7 in this way speaks to a larger issue of a need for social and economic rights to be assured for every Canadian. A critical race theory lens demands a positive right to health be given charter protection. The right to health, as, the right to life as a negative right ignores the systemic barriers that prevent many Canadians from being, to act, being able to access that. It is only sufficient for those whose race has historically granted them unimpeded access to quality health care, whose race has not given them barriers to accessing quality jobs so as to avoid poverty and the resultant poorer health care outcomes. We believe that it is both necessary and right for, the juris for, the law, for Canadian law to advance in this way in light of the historic marginalization faced by Black Canadians. Barring any further questions, Justices, those are my submissions, and I leave it to my co-counsel uh, to conclude. Well, before you conclude, Ms. Moment, may I ask this question? Who will be dealing with the remedy that you're requesting, specifically the order to collect disaggregated data? Uh, if I could have, a, oh, apologies, Justice, continue. No, I, I just wondered if that was you or, or your co-counsel. Uh, I can address that now, if I can just have a brief indulgence to answer that question. Yes. Um, we would say that pursuant to Section 24 of the Charter, this court is empowered uh, to direct the minister to take this action. But, but if we find that it's not a positive obligation, um, normally we would strike um, uh, the, the law as unconstitutional. Uh, but this is, this is a dictating, perhaps, about how a project or a program or data collection would be done. Um, is that the normal constitutional remedy and why would that be merited here? Justice, even the remedy of simply granting declaratory relief, I believe would have the effect of requiring the Minister of Health to change its policy uh, to bring it into compliance with the constitution. Thank you, Justices. Good afternoon, Justices. My name is Flora Juma, and I will be making our final two submissions. I first just wanted to confirm I've been having some internet uh, issues. Is my audio coming through okay? Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Juma. We can hear you very well. Perfect. Thank you. On to my submissions. First, I submit that the Minister's failure to collect race-based data pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic infringes Mr. Williams' right to equality under Section 15 of the Charter. Secondly, the infringements under Section 7 and Section 15 that have been raised cannot be saved under Section 1. These submissions will be predominantly doctrinal. However, my Section 15 submissions will incorporate theory arguments under Step 2 of the Section 15 test. Starting at page 11 and paragraph 30 of the appellant factum, I will begin my submissions by outlining the purpose and substance of section 15. I will then move on to the test for, for an infringement under section 15 
and how Mr. Williams' claim satisfies this test. Finally, I will conclude by submitting that the minister's actions cannot be saved under section, section one. Beginning with my first submission. The vision of equality provided under section 15 of the charter is that of substantive equality, which recognizes and guards against the distributive consequences that can arise where a piece of legislation or government activity engages with the levying of burdens or the denial of benefits. To realize this vision, the enforcement of section 15 rights must be informed by the promotion of human dignity and with a view to preventing the conduct that perpetuates systemic disadvantage against groups within society. This framework of equality then invites an understanding that discrimination operates both directly and indirectly in its effects. Indirect or adverse effects discrimination occurs where a seemingly neutral law has a disproportionate impact on a protected group. It is under this category of adverse effects discrimination which Mr. Williams' claim must be situated. Why is isn't this, excuse me, Ms. Juma, why isn't this direct discrimination? It would seem to me that it's a facially uh, exclusive uh, provision. Uh, it may have an indirect effect of being discriminatory, uh, but it couldn't be more purposeful. Uh, they consciously chose not to collect on this basis. We present our submissions here today under an adverse effects discrimination claim because we felt the language of uh, direct discrimination did not open itself as much to the contextual analysis that the court has invited, especially in the most recent case of Frazier. So while there is some overlap in what could be deemed a direct or indirect, we feel that that analysis of adverse effects discrimination and the language that it evokes best reflects Mr. Williams' claim here. The position of our friends is that Section 15 does not require the minister to eradicate all social and economic inequalities. However, it has been held by the court that where the state does provide a benefit, it is obliged to do so in a non-discriminatory manner. This obligation will often require the government to take positive action, for example, by extending the scope of a benefit to a previously excluded class of persons. Ms. Juma, what is the benefit here? The benefit here to be derived from the collection of uh, disaggregated data is that it directly informs the government's uh, public health care services and uh, activity regarding COVID-19. And given the uh, historical disadvantage and well, the- That sounds like a benefit to the government. What, what's the benefit to the claimant? The benefit to the claimant here is that as historically disadvantaged group with respect to the public health care system in Canada, their disadvantage is exacerbated under a pandemic. Therefore, the services and the services offered and healthcare received through the federal government needs to reflect their situ how they are situated as a group in society. Okay, the, and and so the services relation to the disadvantage is is what? Yes, that is what we submit. Okay. This this is the substance of section 15. I will now move on to how Mr. Williams' claim is captured by and infringed under the charter. The current framework for the minister's COVID-19 data collection provides for the demographic categories of age and sex, but excludes race, thereby creating an under-inclusive benefit conferred by the government. Mr. Williams' position is this. The collection of public health data, which is disaggregated, but fails to account for race is an exercise of statutory power that creates a disadvantage by failing to provide healthcare information and therefore services which respond to the particular social and healthcare experiences of Black Canadians. This piece concerning the social and healthcare context of Black Canadians is important when identifying a Section 15 violation. The analysis for discrimination under Section 15 must account for the political and historical circumstances of the relevant group as against society, because it is these circumstances that give rise to a unique constellation 
of physical, economic, and social barriers. Our friends submit that Mr. Williams' claim fails on the basis that the minister has been consistent with all Canadians in the provision of information and benefits relating to COVID-19. We submit, however, that this position fails to appreciate the meaning and intention of Section 15. It is not sufficient for the minister to simply be consistent in their dealings with all Canadians, as that would be indicative of a formal approach to equality. Facially neutral laws facilitate discrimination by obscuring the unique circumstances through which groups in society experience social and political life by virtue of their membership in that group. Further to that, the court has cautioned that discrimination results where governments continue to do things the way that they have always done. The intention then behind a neutral policy is an insufficient defense where that policy espouses a race-blind formal approach to equality. May I ask you this question? Um, in terms of uh, the Section 15, uh, so the government can say, well, we're, we're gathering um, data on the basis of two uh, of the enumerated grounds that are protected in Section 15. Um, Mr. Williams is saying that's under-inclusive. Uh, you must add race. Uh, what are we to do as a court when we know that there are many other grounds of protected discrimination? Um, do we just deal with race or should we be thinking about the other grounds or is it, how, how does a court approach the, the claim that you're making uh, when uh, there's only two of the protected grounds that have been uh, selected by government? Thank you, Justice. Uh, in response to that, we would submit that there are two elements that for why Mr. Williams' claim is being raised under this. So the first is that it constitutes a protected enumerated ground under Section 15. But what allows this submission and what allows his claim and gives it life is the specific historical disadvantage that is evoked with the con with, under the context of data collection and healthcare. So we would submit that further challenges could be raised by other protected groups if they were able to establish this uh, connect this um, constellation between uh, disadvantage and public health care. So where that would be raised, then the court would be faced with a similar position that they are today. What if the minister were to say, you know, I'm not going to collect any data at all. We're going to repeal any legal authority from parliament. Parliament repeals legal authority granting the minister to collect data on any basis. Right? So including the basis on which it's collecting data now, age and gender, um, would Parliament have a duty then to legislate in order to collect the data that you're saying it has to? Thank you, Justice. If the Parliament was to take a position to suspend all data collection, that would certainly make a more challenging position for claimants such as Mr. Williams to raise. However, under the Department of Health Act and the Statistics Act, the Minister of Health has a duty to collect data right. relating. But, but I'm asking, what if that was repealed? What if what if what if that that duty was repealed and the minister's under no obligation to collect any data and has no authority to do so? Uh, do you then have a claim? If the, if, if the minister made that decision not to collect any data, that would certainly weaken Mr. Williams' claim. However, this claim is being raised in the in the situation where the minister has decided to act on their duty to collect data which allows for Mr. Williams to raise that claim as it responds to, it is not imposing a positive obligation, but speaking to actions that the minister has already decided to take. I will speak briefly about the, hist the history and effects of medical racism. So medical racism has subjugated black communities in this country to substandard health outcomes and to sparse and ineffective public health care services. I apologize. Um, I will be speaking to uh, pages 14 and 15, beginning there. And that is paragraphs, starting at paragraphs 37. I will give you a few moments to. Rooted in the racial myths and stereotypes propagated under slavery, these myths and stereotypes persist disproportionately persist and disproportionately and negatively affect how Black people receive medical, medical treatment, and it has excluded them from fully realizing the benefits of this government service. 
Dr. Onye Norum, president of the Black Physicians Association of Ontario, has added that Black people in Canada are at risk of being treated with less dignity when seeking health care because of the color of their skin. The consensus amongst those invested in the betterment of Black communities' health rights in Canada, that is to say, racial justice advocates, advocates and the medical and medical researchers, they have come to the consensus that Canada's health sector lacks the requires the widespread, reliable, and consistent data to identify the nature and extent of disparities, to target quality improvement efforts, and to monitor progress. Given this context and the prevailing public health pandemic, it follows that a framework of data collection that obscures the gaps in care and healthcare outcomes experienced by Black Canadians necessarily exacerbates the anti-Black racism and discrimination Black Canadians endure. Before moving to my section one analysis, I will quickly address the equity concerns that have been raised for the collection of race-based data. We submit that this position, which asserts that collecting race-based data would exacerbate racial discrimination, we submit that it unduly minimizes the research of racial justice advocates who have determined that the goal of improving quality of healthcare services and outcomes for Black communities and then also reconciling this history of disadvantage is inextricably linked with data collection. A critical race understanding of substantive equality recognizes that systemic racism operates by obscuring the disparities between racial groups and their experience of social, political, and economic institutions. The aim of advocating for the collection of race-informed data is that it is meant to illuminate that which systemic racism does not wish us to see. Moreover, the collaboration between racial justice advocates and the medical community, which has intensified following the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement and the growing COVID-19 pandemic, creates the conditions necessary for Canada's public health sector to identify, monitor, and eliminate racist practices. Therefore, the minister, by employing a neutral data collection policy, erases the healthcare experiences of Black Canadians, and in this knowledge gap, exacerbates the discrimination this group faces in Canadian society. May I interject here? I, ha I have a, a question, I guess, that relates maybe a bit to the theory of the overall claim that you're making, and that is that uh, uh, your colleague has come forward under Section 7, arguing an individual right. You have uh, presented the arguments uh, under Section 15. Uh, judicial economy often uh, forces a court or encourages a court to choose one basis on which they say something is unconstitutional. If we put you to that choice, and say, uh, would, how would you like us to resolve your claim? Would it be a Section 7 claim or would it be a Section 15 claim? I believe that a Section 15 claim would be the best opportunity to resolve the disadvantages that have taken place um, and that Mr. Williams is raising. I, I say that because Section 15's jurisprudence has given due consideration to the historical and contextual disadvantages that claimants face. Moreover, as we are in a unique, we're submitting a unique situation that um, is predicated on the lack of data. Under uh, the most recent case in Frazier, the court acknowledged that there is an evidentiary burden that is disproportionate to certain claimants who must draw from examples that have not been properly accounted for statistically or recognized politically. So I, we submit that Mr. Williams' claim is best situated here as it is alive to the lived experiences of particular claimants. Moving on to the section one analysis, I will focus my submissions here on the discussion on proportionality and the overall balance. And that uh, begins at page 18 and paragraph 43 of the factum. Part of the Oaks test looks to proportionality and of that proportionality analysis, the limitations to which rights might be subject to must achieve an important objective. 
they must also be appropriately tailored and must not be arbitrary, unfair, or irrational in nature. To satisfy this branch of the Oaks test, the infringement must be rationally connected to the objective, minimally impair the rights in question, and in a final balancing, its benefits, benefits must outweigh its costs. The data collected under the current framework is utilized to, act, to assess the needs of the communities and implement suitable support measures during and after the pandemic, and then to make projections based off of the demographic categories of age and sex. Our friends have not demonstrated why this method of data collection that excludes the category of race is minimally impairing given that other demographic categories are accounted for. Further to that, we do not believe that folding in data collection that accounts for race into an already existing framework for data collection would frustrate the objectives, the stated policy objectives of the government. Speaking to the overall balance, this piece of the analysis looks to reconcile individual rights with the broader interests of society. Our submissions are alive to the, to the equity and privacy concerns voiced by our friends and the court below. We submit, however, that these concerns are mitigated by the safeguards already in place to protect against the potential misuse and misapplication of the sort of data that Mr. Williams is seeking. May I interrupt you here? If we go under Section 7, there's uh, been no cases that I can think of that uh, an infringement of Section 7 has been saved, and there's a kind of a category for exceptional circumstances. But what does that mean? I mean, we are in uh, different difficult and exceptional times, but does that mean that we are in exceptional circumstances for constitutional purposes? It is my understanding that the where um, the jurisprudence refers to the extreme circumstances where uh, extreme circumstances for a Section Seven analysis, there is reference made to a uh, to pandemic, and we submit that this COVID nineteen pandemic, which has um, extent the timeline of which is continuously extending, presents those circumstances that have been contemplated. Um, my question is that uh, there's a circumstance in which um, a, a particular government action, as you were saying, is resulting in a disproportionate, um, could result in a disproportionate amount of death in a, in a different, within a segment of, of the overall population. Does that constitute an exceptional circumstance? Um, I'm sorry, can I just ask you to repeat the question? Just yeah, yeah, so it was, it was a bit long. What, I, what I'm trying to understand is that, I, I guess your argument is that the failure to collect the data is resulting in um, disproportionate deaths amongst a particular population, which is the black population. Am I correct? That's the gist of your argument. Is that correct? Yes. And does, does that circumstance um, constitute an exceptional circumstance? I see also that I've run out of time, so may I have an indulgence to answer your question? I, I, I see that the president's saying yes, so please proceed. Okay. Yes, yes, please take the time necessary to answer this important question. We submit that the context uh, in which we are in, which is that COVID-19 has exacerbated um, disparities amongst particular groups in society, and given that the, that exacerbated disparity involves death as well as other harms, many of which are still to be seen as COVID-19 has shown to have long lasting effects. We submit that these are the, this is the context in which an exception must certainly be made. Thank you, would you like to have the opportunity to make a concluding comment? Yes, thank you, Justice. Speaking uh, more so than to the overall balance, I will conclude by saying that the deleterious and salutary effects of a piece of legislation or government activity are to be guided by the promotion of faith in social and political institutions, which enhance the participation of individuals and groups in society. Anti-Black racism in Canada's healthcare system has created a tradition of distrust amongst Black Canadians 
for an institution that is key to sustaining and enjoying life. The minister's actions bar access to the race-informed data, which is vital for efforts to repair this estrangement and are therefore unjustified in a free and democratic society. I will rely on my written submissions for the, my factum for the rest of my submissions, and I thank you justices for your time. Thank you, Ms. Duma. Uh, Ms. Khan and Ms. Domo, um, we will be proceeding uh, with uh, the case for Canada. Thank you, Justice Martin. I will be speak, my name is Tanita Doma and I will be speaking first for 20 minutes and then my co-counsel Sarah Khan will speak for 25 minutes. Thank you, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, justices and friends. The appellant claims that this case is about systemic racism and the utility of disaggregated race-based data as a step towards equality. Instead, Justices, the respondent submits that this case is about what Black patients actually need to navigate this pandemic. They know the role that systemic racism plays in their health care, and they know that their communities are suffering. They have made their concerns known to the federal government, to the point where Canada has now recognized the disproportionate impact of COVID on Black and other racialized communities, as well as the reality of systemic racism in Canada. At this point, the minister needs to focus on the ways that she and her government can serve Black communities directly, rather than collecting more data which will tell her what the government already knows and what Black communities have been telling the federal government. Is there, I, I, I'm sorry to do this. Um, is, there, is there a point um, whereby perhaps the data could reveal some additional information? Um, uh, your friends have indicated that the minister is already collecting the data uh, on gender and sex, I believe. So if you're simply going to uh, add uh, uh, um, race to it, uh, it doesn't look like an onerous uh, undertaking. Am I correct? Justice Barnes, the Minister of Health is already collecting race-based data, disaggregated race-based data. Um, collecting additional data at this point that may provide new insights is not as important as addressing the issues which have already been raised by Black communities at this point. Continuing on and hoping that more information will be revealed doesn't help communities right now, and that's what the minister is trying to focus on. But how? Oh, sorry, Justice Barnes, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Your question. <laughs> All right, just just one more. I, I mean, um, how do you know the importance of what you don't know? Bingo. Justice Barnes and Justice Brown. <laughs> The federal government has been collecting data on the social determinants of health and there's existing research on the social determinants of health as they existed before the pandemic and up until the pandemic, particularly as it impacts on black communities. This data has shown that the social determinants of health have been exacerbated under the conditions of the pandemic. And so knowing this, the minister can act on this information with the additional initiative of doing community consultations where she's able to meet with and address community needs as they're contextualized as opposed to having a broad summary of what's going on and not the particular issues that communities are dealing with. But aren't those same um, community-based, indeed maybe political, um, options also available to those uh, on the basis of age and sex and uh, why would we why would we parse and uh, say that you couldn't have them both justice are you, justice martin are you suggesting that since there are already community community consultation processes being taken undertaken for age and sex that race would just be another option no, but you're putting forward a, a, what I think is an argument that we don't have to be concerned constitutionally because there are political and community-based initiatives in respect of race. And I guess I'm saying, why couldn't we have both? Um, why are we forcing ourselves into um, the folly of an either or when it can be both and thank you? Justice Martin, the federal government does not object to the collection of race-based data um, entirely. 
what we're suggesting is that while this process is continuing on and will continue on, there are issues that need to be addressed right now, which communities have been raising to the federal government, um, including age and sex, but also race, because race has the, a particular effect um, as it interacts with the social determinants of health. For example, black community, black community members are more likely to be frontline workers. They're more likely to experience higher rates of poverty and food insecurity. These are all issues that interact with race particularly and must be addressed in these communities as they intersect with other issues. And that's why community consultation is a more viable option at this point because it addresses those multiple intersecting issues as well as race. What if you weren't doing those community consultations? Does the constitution require you to do them or would the constitution, if you didn't do them, require you to collect the data that your friends are saying should be collected now? Just as under the Department of Health Act, it's section two, the minister does have the, she, as part of her powers and duties, she is required to collect information as it relates to public health. And but, she's- but You heard my question to your friend earlier. What if that was repealed? Would, would the constitution then step in and require that in your judgment? Part of the Minister of Health's mandate is to protect public health. She requires information to be able to respond to the to the public's needs. So even if she wasn't, well, she can only she can only act as Parliament directs her. If Parliament doesn't direct her to do that, she can't. But then the question, my question is, does the Constitution then step in to require it for for the reasons that your friends have said? Justice, the minister, if the minister in this case, but I'm trying to understand the bounds of, 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 of the constitution's application to this case. Justice, are you asking if the minister should be able to basically determine on her own discretion what she should be able to do? You have limited time, so I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but, but okay. you are being asked, you are being asked why don't you collect this? The answer that you gave is, well, we already have that information from the communities and, and because we consult. And then I'm asking, well, what if you didn't consult? And what if nothing required you to get this data? The minister didn't have this duty at all. Would the constitution then step in and require you to do it? In other words, is the only reason the constitution not forcing the minister you say to collect this data is because of what the minister is already doing or does it matter? Even before, the minister is not the only person who collects disaggregated race-based data. It's done under the census for um, Statistics Canada. So this information has existed. Even if the minister wasn't required to collect it, it's being collected just as, a per as part of the census. The minister has chosen to collect it for the purposes of this, for the, for the COVID pandemic, because it is important to understand race as it interacts with social determinants of health. And so she's doing both at the same time while also implementing community consultation initiatives. The respondent's position on this matter is that the Supreme Court of Canada was correct in finding that the appellant section seven and 15 rights were not violated. For the court's purposes, this is what we intend to argue today. I will outline our first two theoretical arguments from our factum, the first argument concerning the social determinants of health and the second argument outlining the practical and logistical issues with data collection. I will then detail the respondent's first doctrinal submission, which is that the appellant's section 15 charter right was not violated. My co-counsel Ms. Khan will then present the respondent's third and final theoretical argument, which outlines the potential for the misuse of race-based data. Ms. Khan will then take the court through the respondent's submissions on why Mr. Williams' Section 7 charter right was not violated and the respondent's final submission that any charter violations are justified through the application of Section 1 of the charter. The respondent's first submission begins at paragraph 10 of the respondent's factum and states that the social determinants of health should be the minister's primary focus in navigating the COVID-19 pandemic not collecting race-based data. For the court's understanding, the social determinants of health are the socioeconomic factors that apply to a specific community or communities 
and impact their health outcomes as a result. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you there and say, yes. then if that was really your goal, why wouldn't you collect race-based uh, data? Um, in the Supreme Court of uh, Justice Brown uh, sort of makes the comment uh, that, well, the government, we, the courts don't have the expertise uh, to deal with it. But surely we have the expertise to deal with data and evidence. I mean, this is what we do all of the time. And it would seem to me, and I, I would like an answer about this at the theoretical level as well. What is going on here is, is a group of, of individuals who, are, who say their health is socially determined. And you seem to agree with that. They're saying, you are not counting us. So how can this court... Uh, deal with that on any other basis than to say the government is saying they do not count. Justice, what they're saying is that the government is not paying attention to their issues. And that is a reality that the federal government and the Minister of Health has recognized in terms of their role in exacerbating the conditions of systemic racism in Canada. The Minister acknowledges that the federal government has a role to play in ameliorating those conditions. And that is why she's implementing practices of community consultation where she can hear from the communities themselves in their own words so that they are able to tell the federal government what their issues are. And then the federal government is able to respond directly to those issues. Will you be addressing Justice Brown's statement below? set of reasons that by and large I thought were pretty good, but, it, but I, I really, um, I, I, I was curious about some of the things he said in paragraph five, and in particular, um, he speculated that confirmation that more black people have been impacted by COVID-19 will increase racial prejudice against these people who will then assume wrongly that they're the authors of their own misfortune. Will you be dealing with that argument or will your friend be your colleague be? I will partially be dealing with the issue of uh, the, the practical and logistical issues with data collection, but my co-counsel will primarily be dealing with the issue of race being framed as a biological determinant of health. I'll, I'll save my tender mercies for you. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Brown. Gear the up. federal government, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, Justice Brown, did you? I was just saying, up? gear up, Ms. Khan. <laughs> The federal government published a report that specifically tied racism to health outcomes for black communities, given the complements of all the factors I previously listed and more in the context of anti-black racism. At this point, the federal government in collaboration or in addition to municipalities and community organizations have collected enough data to demonstrate that black communities are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Black community members, for example, are more, much more likely to be frontline workers, as I mentioned earlier. They experience higher rates of food insecurity, and Black communities have been sounding the alarm about these issues since before the pandemic began, and now have been telling their elected officials that the pandemic is hitting them harder. It is not a particular quality of their race or ethnicity on a genetic level that COVID is having such an impact on Black communities, as my co-counsel will address. It is the social determinants of health that are weaponized against Black communities because of systemic racism. The appellant has also provided significant evidence that demonstrates the impact of systemic racism on Black communities as they access healthcare in Canada. However, the appellant has failed to demonstrate that the collection of race-based data in itself will solve these issues without further steps to be taken. While the respondent agrees that the federal government has a responsibility to, co to correct these issues on a structural level, the respondent submits that given what is already known, the, the minister is well equipped to address those further steps now. And but just but is, 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 that the, is that in fact the, the applicant's burden is to, to demonstrate that data will solve issues? Or is the applicant's burden to show that there is uh, a decision taken by government that jeopardizes their life, liberty and security of the person or undermines their uh, uh, group rights to uh, having data accumulated on the basis of the group to which they belong. On both counts, the appellant has not met their burden of evidence to demonstrate that the, what they claim is the minister's inaction on the collection of race-based data has impacted on 
the appellant's um, Section 7 or Section 15 rights because the minister has been collecting race-based data and she's coupling it with community con consultations and other initiatives that address contextually the issues that Black communities are facing. I will now move on to the respondent's second argument, which concerns the logistical issues with data collection by themselves and in the context of a pandemic. This argument begins at paragraph 16 of the respondent's factum. I will raise two points in this argument. First, the collection of race-based data may unintentionally exclude communities by categorizing them improperly, which would defeat the purpose of data collection in the first place if they're not included within that data. Second, Black patients have raised concerns about the collection of race-based data while they're seeking healthcare treatment and may be distrustful of an institution that is collecting their race data as well, an issue that the minister must address and that was raised by our friends. To my first point, it has already been documented that failing to properly categorize ethno-racial groups can negatively impact specific groups. For example, the respondent notes at paragraph 20 that in one U.S. study, the high infant mortality rate among Hmong children, I, my apologies for the typo, isn't clear because they're lumped in with Asian children in general who have a relatively low infant mortality rate. But this is, uh, sorry, isn't this possible no matter what, uh, um, um, metric you use i mean you, they could be uh, they could they, it could happen if you focus on sex it could happen if you could um i, I believe it's 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 agents and gender that is being collected am i correct i'm going by memory that the uh parents submitted yes well I, what i'm trying to say is that whatever metric you use there's always a likelihood that there may be some mischaracterization certainly perfection shouldn't be uh what is required um, in a case like this. Justice Barnes, the minister can work on that issue um, over the long term, but in the meantime, right now, what's needed to be done is community issues must be addressed. Black community issues must be addressed, and that's why the minister is also undertaking community consultation. So, so you're saying that simply uh, putting in an additional box for ticking it will be difficult? Because that, that's all I think is required, or is it more than that that is required? Justice, it's not simply um, an additional box that needs to be ticked. Right. Um, for example, I can give you the example of the U.S. Census in, in 1990, where you were only allowed to check one box for your race, and that meant there were two million Indigenous people who declared themselves in the U.S. But then in the next census, when you're allowed to check multiple boxes, that number doubled. So that's a huge difference just because of a box that's being checked. And so when the minister is creating these types of data collection methods, it's vital that it's done properly. Otherwise, the information that comes out of it is not going to be useful because it's not going to be accurate. So it's much better to ignore it and have um, uh, a whole segment of society die in a proportionate fashion. No justice, it's not more, that's not the, the avenue that the minister wishes to take. That's why the minister, while this, process is being worked out. She's going and meeting with, and the federal government is also consulting with communities on an individual and a community basis so that they're not being ignored simply because of this issue. Has, has a constitutional analysis ever allowed a let us work it out politically and we'll see if we can respect the rights analysis, which is what I, I, I fear that I'm hearing that you're urging upon us. Just as the minister does not wish to, um, to portray that perspective to this honorable court. What the minister has acknowledged though as part of her mandate is that she must protect public health and specifically delineating um, the particular plight of racialized communities and especially black communities. She's taking steps to address those issues and 
while acknowledging that it can't be done overnight, it's something that she's continually taking steps on as she's already addressed um, in terms of her acknowledgement of this issue. Justices, I noticed that my time is almost up. Um, may I have a moment to conclude? Yes, please conclude. Justices, the federal government has race-based COVID data and it has research on how the social determinants of health make black and other racialized communities more susceptible to disease. The purpose in collecting race-based data is to indicate to the federal government what the issues are and how they can be addressed. If the federal government is already aware of these issues which have been raised by municipalities, health researchers, other organizations, and most importantly by the communities themselves, what is needed in this moment is decisive action and not more data collection. If there are no further questions, my co-counsel will now address the remainder of our submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Khan? Good afternoon, justices and friends. The respondent's decision to not collect additional data with an unknown scope and methodology is grounded in light of the long history of systemic racism in Canada and the intense pressures of the current global crisis. There is sufficient race-based data for the respondent to take public health measures. She must also consider other tools that are available. If the minister was to collect additional race-based data, they must do so in a way that it provides additional insight into curbing the effects of systemic racism and the impacts of COVID on Black individuals. My co-counsel discussed the logistical challenges that contributed to less informative data. I will discuss how an unknown scope and methodology for collecting race-based data can have unintended consequences of harming vulnerable groups and perpetuating systemic racism. Uh, but your my first, excuse me, your colleagues ask us to, to issue an order uh, in which we could uh, be very specific. So it would not be an unknown scope, uh, perhaps, and it might not be uh, a questionable methodology. Um, so, so please take that into account when you're uh, dealing with your, your arguments, because we may not accept your premise. Justice, would you like me to address this issue right now or during my submissions? As, as you choose, but I would like to have them addressed at what, some point. Okay, thank you, Justice. My first theoretical argument will explain how the collection of race-based data could entrench racism against Black Canadians. In my second theoretical have argument- Have you heard that you, have, that you collect race-based data? We've heard this. Right. One of the one of the reasons that your your colleague gives that for for not requiring um, the sort of data that your friends are require would 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 have us require is well we're already collecting it well well if, uh, that sounds like a pretty bad idea based on the submission you've just made. Justice, the respondent submits that there that uh, that they are collecting race based data on the social determinants of health. And there's been census that has been uh, that was collected in 2016. Uh, in addition, uh, the respondent has also been connect collecting data on the economic impacts of COVID-19 on racialized individuals uh, through Stats Canada. Right, and uh, I'm saying I'm saying based on the statement that, mm -hmm. that you made, that doesn't sound like a very good thing to be doing. Because Justice, it might increase racial, it might it might increase racism in Canada. Justice, this point will be in consideration of how the respondent must ensure that the process of collecting more race-based data does not perpetuate racism. So in my submissions, I will be discussing how, um, say, within the healthcare system, uh, when uh, patients are surveyed, um, there may be categorizations and stereotypes that are used in the surveys that may essentially um, create a more stressful environment for racialized individuals. So this may be something within the process that the respondent must consider when they're creating a, scope, a new scope of data for collecting uh, information. 
So the question really isn't, it, I mean, the, the answer now seems to be from the minister, um, sure, we can collect this data. Um, you can even make us do it. Just, just allow us to, to craft the questions or, or, or craft the lexicon in a certain way uh, so as not to create bigger problems. But that's, I mean, that goes really in a way to what Justice Martin was asking, because it may just be a question of crafting the terms of the order. Justice, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. I'm aware. Yes. So the respondent wants to prioritize taking public health measures. The race-based data creates a broad analysis of the trends that are happening in the country. But the respondent believes that by using community consultation but, and by contextualizing issues within communities will provide a better indicator of what is happening. As we know, um, Black individuals across the country are not homogenous. They're not facing the same uh, realities. And so race is one factor that must be considered in um, consideration of other intersectional issues. So when- I think that's what your friends are saying. Yes. So the respondent agrees with that uh, premise. So- <laughs> oh, oh, Sorry, I, I just wanna be clear. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, we agree that we should collect it, but we are in the middle of a pandemic. And so we don't think we can do it well because if we're going to collect it, we should do it well. We're in the middle of a pandemic, so we should focus on something else. But we agree we should collect it. Is that what you're saying? Justice, the respondent submits that, the, that she has been collecting data on the social determinants. She has research on social determinants of health um, and there has been data that has been collected by the respondent, as well as the provincial and municipal bodies. What she is saying is if she was to collect more data that does not have a delineated scope and methodology, then she needs time to do that. And that time is may be uh, to the detriment of vulnerable and racialized individuals. And what she should focus on is prioritizing public health measures with community consultation. May I get back to the theory that you're putting forward? Um, it sounds a lot to me as if- Justice, forgive me, my internet connection uh, is not very good. All right, do you want me to um, go back? And uh, can you hear me now? Maybe we should suspend the time really quickly here. Yes, if we could suspend the time, that would be helpful. And we'll await Ms. Khan's return, because I think that uh, maybe we have lost her. Yeah, she froze on my screen. Uh, Justice, would it be okay if I turn off my camera? Um, I think that might help with my internet connection. Uh, clearly, uh, whatever you think uh, will, will best uh, suit is, is, I'm sure, fine uh, with the judges. Of course, we like to see you, but if, if that uh, gets in the way of you making your argument in your best way possible, do as, do as you, you need to. Forgive me. I, I think that might be the best approach at this point. All right. Thank you. Um, I did not hear the question, uh, Justice. Well, it was a very good question. So <laughs> no, I'm very happy to repeat it. And it builds on what Justice Martin said in the Supreme Court. So I'm, I'm doubly delighted. Um, Ms. Khan, what, what I'm trying to understand it, when you're saying that the process should not perpetuate ra racism, mm -hmm. from a theoretical perspective, aren't we so far past the idea that if you start to talk about race, you are creating the problem. Um, isn't the problem not talking about race? Justice, the respondent has been um, has been approached by communities before the pandemic on the, the race-based issues that communities have been facing. Uh, uh, we've been approached by the, the community organizations and experts alike. 
Um, so racism is not new and the respondent has, is aware of systemic racism. And what res the respondent has seen since the pandemic is that these social inequities uh, within these communities have aggravated the impacts of COVID-19. So uh, going back to the point uh, that, uh, uh, that was made here about not talking about race, Justice, the respondent wants to talk about race and they want the community leaders and the community members to be at the forefront to voice their concerns um, that they're facing. Um, institutional race-based data can provide uh, a broader scope of what is happening, um, but that is just one piece of the puzzle. That she must use other tools to understand and, con and contextualize the issues but nobody's, that are being nobody's facing. Saying she can't. Nobody is saying she can't use those other tools. What's, what's being asked here is whether the Constitution requires her to use among the tools the sort of collection that your friends are seeking. Nobody's, nobody's doubting the efficacy or the desirability of the other tools. Justice, the respondent submits that she must prioritize taking public health measures um, and doing more community consultation in regard to the other tools. The respondent does not, but the respondent believes that aggregate race-based data provides information, but in the midst of a pandemic, when lives are being lost, then she must prioritize what is going to be the most effective way of dealing with the pandemic. So what do you say, um, this is a bit off the track, but not far. What do you say about what this Brown guy said at the Supreme Court? Um, uh, you heard me uh, point to paragraph five uh, with your friend, with your colleague. Do you do you do you adopt that argument that he makes, or that he speculates that um, confirmation that more Black people have been impacted by COVID nineteen will increase racial prejudice among those people, but among people who who assume wrongly that they're the author of their own misfortune. Res Justice, the respondent believes that there has been an uptick in uh, race-based um, violence against uh, Black individuals and other racialized individuals okay. um, during this pandemic. Yes. And, and, but uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not asking about the, the, um, the empirical support for the statement. I'm wondering if it's a very good argument. In light, for example, that of mm -hmm. Section 15.2, which contemplates programs that ameliorate uh, the circumstances of disadvantaged people. And in light of, for example, the, the I mean, it's fairly widely known um, about the disparate impact of COVID-19 on First Nations people, uh, especially First Nations people living on reserve. And it's fairly widely known that in many cases, they are receiving priority for, for whatever vaccinations are available. Um, that doesn't seem to bother the minister. That doesn't seem uh, to bother the federal government. Uh, why, why, is that, why does that argument have such currency here? Justice, would you mind um, phrasing the question a bit more for me? I don't have the privilege of this um, decision in front of me. So paragraph five, Brown J says, Perhaps confirmation that more black people have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic will increase racial prejudice against those people who some will wrongly assume are the authors of their own misfortune. And you say, well, in fact, we're seeing an uptick in racism. And I say, That's, that, that, that may be so. Um, but, but I'm just wondering about the relevance or the strength of the argument. What do you say? Justice, the, the respond, this is one of the considerations that the respondent must take when they're creating a methodology for race-based data, that there is misinformation out there um, and there's going to be, and there has been unfortunately xenophobia and, uh, against racialized and black individuals. So uh, with that in consideration, the, res the respondent submits that this is the very reason why public health measures must be prioritized over race-based data. Uh, 
I, I'm sorry, Ms. Connor. I still find myself coming back to this idea about, I guess, the theory, which is you seem to be saying that a court, as the guardian of constitutional rights, should be content with an answer that Black Canadians should go to power structures and ask for better treatment rather than going to courts with their constitutional rights in their hands and insisting that they be included. Why, why, how can the government take that position in a constitutional democracy? Justice, the minister has a mandate under section, section 42 to protect uh, the health of uh, all Canadians. Um, and that is under constitutional uh, scrutiny. Uh, but the, uh, my friends here are asking for the court to impose uh, race-based data uh, as though that would be enough for the respondent to take additional public health measures. The respondent believes uh, that she has the ministerial discretion to use race-based data in addition to other tools to ensure that she's getting a comprehensive understanding of the, uh, the issues that are dealt with within uh, communities. Um, and to understand how uh, different variables are playing a role. Um, and so she's balancing the broader trends with the contextual understanding of the different issues that are being uh, faced by Black and racialized individuals. Okay. Um, so so moving on uh, to my first argument, uh, I will start by discussing how the collection of race-based data can have unintended consequences on patients accessing healthcare and, ra and on racial groups having the prevalence of a disease. Uh, this argument can be found on paragraph 16 of the Respondent's Factum. Several countries around the world have an established practice of collecting race-based data on patients frequenting their healthcare system. The purpose of this data is to ensure that patients of all racial and ethnic backgrounds are receiving the full benefit of an accessible healthcare system. However, research has found that the process of collecting race-based data can have the potential to harm medical patients. Justices, Patients accessing healthcare often feel vulnerable because of their illness, disability, and social positioning. These factors are compounded for racialized and marginalized patients. UBC professor Colleen Varco found that racial surveys may use stereotypes and categorizations that, dist that distinguish racialized individuals from the norm. As a result, racialized individuals may feel judged because of their race, ethnic, and social conditions. The interactions between the patient and the healthcare staff could become more stressful for patients, and they may actually have less access to healthcare resources because of negative stereotyping. During the study, one of the participants who identified as Black expressed fear that survey questions could lead to discrimination and poor quality of care. Another participant who also identified as Black stated that survey questions suggested that racism was being monitored. So these perceptions are subjective. However, their concerns are still valid. Vorko pointed out that, for example, aboriginality can be pathologized as a risk factor for certain social problems. May I ask you this question? Are there any uh, uh, studies that you've looked at that have not focused, for example, on the reactions of the individuals um, but on the healthcare providers. And what I'm thinking there is um, you, you're arguing that there's maybe room for uh, some, uh, some racism and, and myths and stereotypes playing out. But is there also, or do we know um, if the healthcare providers uh, will see that this is a, a, a signaling, that this is a patient of equal dignity and that they must receive equal treatment and that the caretaker, the healthcare provider will be responsible and accountable for the quality of service to an individual? 
Justice, we know that there has been a coroner's inquest that was that happened in British Columbia um, as a result of uh, increased um, medical racism against Indigenous uh, patients in, Canada, in uh, British Columbia. Um, and the respondent uh, has noted that there's been medical racism, in, in fact, across the country. Um, and, and they are working in um, collaboration with the provinces at this point to uh, come up with a strategy of tackling medical racism. Um, so it has been acknowledged um, and it, it, however, it's, a, it's an active issue at this point. Um, and at, at the same time, uh, the respondent also notes um, that there are studies where um, um, researchers that looked at how medical patients view um, black patients coming from certain kinds of neighborhood. And they've seen that they, in their rhetoric, sometimes they view, they, um, they, they see this as a way of othering um, individuals. And so the, even within um, the rhetoric, sometimes uh, individuals get racialized uh, and, so, and there is an active unconscious bias uh, within the medical system. Thank you. So in the process of collecting new race-based data, the respondent must weigh the potential benefits with the adverse impacts. Race-based data is not the only answer. She must explore alternative ways of collecting uh, information to ensure the best procedure. The respondent must protect Black and other racialized communities across Canada by ensuring that new, that new race-based data does not replicate structural racism against vulnerable patients within the healthcare system. I now move on to my next theoretical argument found on paragraph 23 of the respondent's factum. The respondent agrees with the appellant that race-based data has the potential to provide valuable information on the impacts of the pandemic on black individuals across Canada and on systemic racism. If the respondent is to collect additional race-based data, then the scope of data must be properly delineated with cultural safeguards. The respondent must also consider the potential misuse of data, which can perpetuate racism. One such example is through the study of genomes that looks at race as a biological determinant to explain the disparities of health among racial groups. This argument can be found on paragraph 23 of the respondent's factum. The study of genomes can assist with rare hereditary diseases. However, there is no scientific consensus that race as a biological determinant can reliably explain the disparities of health among racial groups. This line of increase gaining popularity despite inconclusive data. Race as an independent biological determinant is not a reliable predictor of health because of the large genetic variation within black communities. Dr. Ratimi from Howard University's Human Genome Center pointed to the absurdity that somehow black individuals, unlike their white counterparts, evolved into acquiring bad genes. According to Dorothy Roberts, a scholar from Harvard University, uh, pointed out that the prevalence of common diseases can be explained by social determinants of health among racial groups. In the context of the global pandemic, social variables such as low income, education, overcrowded housing condition, and preca precarious work are factors that are contributing to the higher number of cases of COVID-19 among Black Canadians. For these reasons, the Minister of Health must ensure that race-based data is properly designed to prevent uh, reductive conclusions rooted in eugenics and white supremacy. This concludes my theoretical arguments. I now move on to my doctrinal arguments. Justice, I see that uh, my time is running low. Um, I will start with the section seven argument unless you choose, you prefer that I um, were, that I address other issues or other questions that you may have. Please proceed as you so choose. 
the respondent submits that their decision not to collect additional race-based data does not violate the appellant section seven right under the charter. And as such, the minister's decision was in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. This argument can be found on paragraph 29 of the respondent's factum. The respondent submits that the appellant's protected rights of bodily autonomy, physical and psychological integrity, and basic human dignity are being infringed by the pandemic and not by the respondent's failure to collect additional data. The social determinants of health have been exacerbated by the impacts of the pandemic on black and racialized individuals in Canada. Now is a time to take decisive public health measures to protect the life, liberty, and security of the appellant and other Canadians. Can you just, uh, do you say that this is a positive obligation or do you accept that, uh, that uh, um, once you've entered the field, you have an obligation to do so according to the principles of fundamental justice and section 15 of the law? Uh, Justice, section 15, did you say? I'm sorry, to clarify. Um, my, the focus of my question, Ms. Khan, is more, is this, uh, do you accept the, the, the argument that was accepted at the Supreme Court, that this is in essence asking for a positive obligation to be imposed on the government? And how do you meet your, your colleagues' uh, counter argument that you have entered the field and we're not talking about positive or negative obligations? We're talking about under-inclusive actions. Justice, when it comes to, I will address the part of under-inclusive action. Um, Justice, the action is to take public health measures under the mandate of section four sub two. Um, and that is to protect the health of Canadians. Um, and the respondent has, can do so with several um, methods um, that is to collect information uh, and understand how this, the, 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 the disease is spreading. Um, so to your point, Justice, the respondent does not have a positive obligation. While the, the court has left the door open under Goslin, um, there has been no legal framework to understand how the positive obligation must be implemented. Um, within the dissent of Goslin, uh, it was submitted that a positive obligation must be recognized within the framework of legal rights uh, within a criminal proceeding. And so when it comes to outside of the realm of legal rights, uh, it is not, under, it is not um, clear how positive obligation must be recognized. Justice, I can see that my time is up. May I have a brief moment to conclude? I, well, because of your internet difficulties, um, may I extend to you an extra five minutes that you can deal with um, as you like and during that time also conclude. Okay, thank you. Substantive equality. So going back to section seven, um, oh, Justice, do, did I answer your question correctly or do I need to elaborate further? You're yes, muted. you answered it, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, so, okay, so divisions of power is an appropriate principle of fundamental justice in this case. Although health falls within the provincial jurisdiction of the Minister of Health, um, it is our mandate to protect the health and interest of all Canadians. Uh, under this mandate, the minister must take measures to protect Canadians from the spread of diseases, to investigate and research into public health uh, measures and to monitor diseases. It is within the minister's discretion to delineate the collection of data. The collection of data is a method for the minister to research and to monitor uh, the disease um, and to understand the broader trends on the impact of COVID-19. However, race-based data is one of the tools that she know she uses to inform of herself of uh, the, the spread of the disease. And she may use other tools 
as necessary for understanding uh, the scope of the issues. The minister's discretion is also consistent with the previous court's decision within Williams in Canada, where the court also did not delineate how the scope of data should be collected. Um, the minister's discretion to collect additional race-based data falls within the principles of divisions of power. Divisions of power is a legal principle that is enshrined within the constitution. It has significant societal consensus. It is also a manageable standard for measuring the protected right under section seven. It is within the minister's discretion to prioritize taking health measures instead of collecting additional race-based data. Unlike race-based data, public health measures will make a difference in saving lives and protecting the lives of black individuals. I will now proceed to my next doctrinal argument. The respondent submits that if the honorable court finds an infringement of section seven and section 15 rights, then they are justified under section one of the charter. This argument can be found on paragraph 49 of the respondent's factum. In the first part of the Oaks test, the respondent submits that their objective was pressing and substantial. It is to preserve the health of Canadians living through the pandemic. Black individuals are at the forefront as they are disproportionately impacted by the crisis. The, de the decision to refuse to collect additional data was based on what is currently needed to respond to the crisis. In the second part of the Oaks test, the respondent submits that there was a rational connection between the objective of protecting can Canadians' health and the minister's decision not to collect additional race-based data. The respondent has prioritized public health measures that affect all Canadians while making public commitments to understand and address systemic racism as it operates in the Canadian healthcare system. The respondent is not disputing that the minister has to take action. She is disputing whether race-based data should be, collecting, should be collected right now when a comprehensive methodology and scope of data has not been delineated. Furthermore, there is minimal impairment by the refusal as a minister has collected data on the impacts of COVID-19 on racialized Canadians and on social determinants of health. There are challenges to collecting useful race-based data. However, data has already emerged on the social determinants of health and how COVID-19 has affected racialized people. Collecting more data is unlikely to reveal new information in time for the pandemic. Lastly, the respondent submits that the importance of the objective outweighs the limitation on the appellant's rights under section 15 and seven. Public health measures is a priority because they will have an immediate and direct effect on saving lives. Justice, I can see that my time is up. May I have a few moments to conclude? Yes. Okay. I think my internet connection is okay now. Justices, we're fighting a global pandemic. The COVID crisis has disproportionately impacted the appellant because of systemic racism, as well as social determinants of health. The federal government has already been collecting race-based data in the context of the pandemic. The pre-existing social inequities and systemic racism have aggravated the impacts of COVID-19 on racialized and in particular black and indigenous communities. The respondent is relying on the existing data to respond to the pandemic. Collecting new race-based data requires a careful review of scope and methodology that is culturally safe and comprehensive to ensure that new insights can be gained without causing undue harm to black individuals. De developing a new scope in the midst of a crisis may not provide new insights into mitigating harm to racialized individuals. If the court has no further questions, these are my submissions. Oh, you're, you're on mute, Justice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Council, for your submission. Thank you all for your submissions.
I know that I speak on behalf of Justices uh, Brown, Bouget, and Barnes to say that it has been our honor uh, to preside on the Julius Alexander uh, Isaac Moot uh, this afternoon. Um, and that uh, we would just uh, I'd like to remind everybody who is here or who sees this uh, presentation that when judges ask questions, they are not expressing opinions. They are engaged in a pedagogical exercise with students in an effort to uh, challenge and maybe even assist with moving an argument along. And so uh, with, that, uh, with that word about uh, how it is that these uh, events work, I'd like to uh, thank everyone uh, for participating. We will take this matter under reserve and uh, the, uh, we will retire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justices. So this marks the conclusion of the final round of this year's Julius Alexander Isaac Moot. We'd once again like to thank our honorable justices, our exceptional oralists and coaches, and all of our participating schools.